part one chapters seventeen eighteen and nineteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen two shameless characters when marius had related his adventure to the jailer and flower-girl the latter exclaimed we're no better off than we were why did you lose your temper that man might have lent you the money women possess a certain obstinacy which renders the feminine conscience easier therefore fine loyal girl though she was would perhaps have closed her ears at rostand's or even have made use of the secret chance placed in her possession robert Tegas felt rather ashamed at having advised marius to go to the banker i warned you sir he said i was aware of the rumours afloat about the man but i thought a great deal was said out of spite had i known the real truth i would never have sent you to him marius and fine spent the afternoon in forming extravagant plans and cudgelling their brains in vain for a means of obtaining the fifteen thousand francs necessary for philippe's safety what exclaimed the young woman can't we find in all this town some kind soul willing to help us out of our trouble are there no rich people here who would lend their money at a reasonable rate come uncle think a bit tell me of some benevolent person whom i may go and plead to on my knees robert shook his head well yes he replied there are worthy people here rich folk who would perhaps assist you but you have no claim on their bounty you can't go and ask them for money right off you must apply to money-lenders or bill discounters and as you've no solid security to offer you're obliged to deal with usurers oh i know some old misers old rascals would be delighted to have you in their clutches or else would chuck you out like dangerous beggars as fine listened to her uncle all these money questions got rather mixed in her young head she was so frank so open-hearted that it seemed to her quite natural and easy to ask for and obtain a large sum in a couple of hours there are millionaires who can so easily dispose of a few thousand francs without inconveniencing themselves she therefore persisted come think well she said again to the jailer do you really know of nobody we might apply to robert Tegas, greatly affected looked at her anxious face he would rather not have laid bare the unsavoury realities of life before this young creature full of the hopes of youth no really he replied i know of no one i have spoken to you of old rascals who have shamelessly made large fortunes they like rostan lend a hundred francs to receive a hundred and fifty at the end of three months he hesitated and then went on in a lower tone of voice shall i relate to you the history of one of these men his name is Romieux, and he's a retired notary his game was to prosecute a terrible chase after inheritances he would introduce himself into families where his calling should have made him a confidant and friend and there study the ground and prepare his ambuscades whenever he came across a weak-minded person who had property to leave he became his creature circumvented him and drew him gradually into his meshes by obsequiousness and blandishments by quite a clever comedy of little attentions and filial tenderness ah he was a clever fellow you should have seen him fascinate his prey making himself supple and winning gaining a hold on the affections of some old man he ousted the natural heirs the nephews and cousins by degrees and then drew up a new will which despoiled them of their relative's fortune and appointed him sole legatee but he never hurried matters he would take ten years to reach his goal to mature things thoroughly he advanced with feline craftiness creeping along in the dark never springing upon his prey until it lay panting rendered inert by his gaze and caresses he hunted inheritances like the tiger hunts game with noiseless cruelty and a ferocity hidden behind smirks and smiles fine fancied she was being told a story out of the arabian nights she listened to her uncle her eyes wide open with astonishment marius was becoming familiar with base actions and you say this man made a large fortune he asked the jailer yes the latter replied there are some strange stories told which prove rumier's amazing cleverness for instance ten or fifteen years ago he worked his way into the good graces of an old lady who possessed a fortune of close upon five hundred thousand francs it was quite a conquest the old lady became his slave almost to the point of refusing herself a crust of bread in order not to encroach upon the wealth she wished to leave to this demon who possessed her like a devil and obtained complete mastery over her 
she was indeed possessed in the true sense of the word all the holy water of a church would not have been sufficient to cast him out a visit from rumieux would plunge her into endless ecstasy when he bowed to her in the street it was as though she had received a shock she became quite red with joy one has never been able to understand by what flattery by what skilful and irresistible advance the notary had been able to penetrate so deeply into this heart which was closed by the most exaggerated piety when the old lady died she despoiled her direct heirs and left her five hundred thousand francs to romieux everybody expected this would happen after a pause Robert Tegas went on listen i can give you another instance the anecdote contains quite a cruel comedy in which romieu gave proof of rare artfulness a man named richard who had amassed several hundred thousand francs in business retired and went to live with a worthy couple who nursed him and enlivened his old age in exchange for their affectionate attentions the retired merchant had promised to leave them his fortune they lived on in this expectation they had several children whom they hoped to establish well in life but rumieux happened to pass by and soon became richard's intimate friend he would take him occasionally into the country and secretly obtained complete mastery over him the family which had received the retired merchant suspected nothing they continued to nurse him and await the inheritance during fifteen years they lived thus quite easy in their minds forming plans for the future and feeling certain of being happy and rich richard died and on the morrow rumieux was found to have inherited his property to the great surprise and grief of this family swindled both in its affections and its interest such is the hunter after inheritances when he moves one cannot hear the sound of his claws upon the ground his bounds are too rapid to be measured he has already sucked his prey dry before he has been observed to be upon it fine felt filled with disgust no no she said i will never go and ask money of such a man don't you know another uncle all usurers are alike my poor child replied the jailer they all have some indelible stain on their lives i know an old skinflint who has more than a million and who lives alone in a dirty tumble-down house guillaume buries himself out of sight in his foul den the damp is rotting the walls the floor is not even paved but is a sort of muck heap consisting of mud and filth cobwebs hang from the ceiling the dust lies thick over everything while a dull lugubrious light penetrates through the window panes which are coated thick with dirt the old miser seems to sleep amidst impurities like the waiting spider sleeps in the centre of his web on the beam when some prey becomes entangled in the nets he has spread he draws it to him and sucks it dry of its life-blood his food consists solely of vegetables cooked in plain water and he never satisfies his hunger he clothes himself in rags and leads the life of a leprous beggar and all this for the sake of keeping the money he has already accumulated and of adding unceasingly to his store he only lends at cent per cent fine turned pale at the picture her uncle was setting before her guillaume has friends however who extol his piety continued the jailer he believes in neither heaven nor hell and would sell the saviour a second time if he had the opportunity but he has been clever enough to sham great devoutness and this piece of acting has won him the esteem of certain narrow minds he may be met dragging himself about the churches kneeling behind every pillar using gallons of holy water inquire throughout the town ask any one what good action this saintly person has ever done he worships the almighty it is said but he robs his fellow-man it's impossible to name a single creature he has ever assisted he lends at an usurious rate he has never given a copper in charity were some poor wretch to be dying at his door he wouldn't take him a crust of bread nor a glass of water if he enjoys any kind of esteem it's because he has stolen it the same as everything else he possesses robert Tega stopped and looked at his niece scarcely knowing whether he should continue and you would be simple enough to apply to such a man said he at last i cannot tell you everything i cannot speak of his vices for the old scoundrel has ignoble ones at times he forgets his avarice to satisfy his lust there are shocking stories told of him enough cried marius energetically fine confused and dismayed bowed her head having lost all courage and hope 
i see money is too dear the young man resumed and that one must sell oneself to obtain it ah if i had only the time to earn the sum we require by hard work then all three remained silent unable to find a means of salvation chapter eighteen in which there is a glimmer of hope the following morning marius urged on by necessity decided on calling on m de Girousse. he had been thinking of applying to the old count ever since he had been in search of money but had always refrained from doing so on account of the nobleman's original bluntness he felt ashamed to own his poverty and blushed at the thought of having to confess to what use he proposed putting the amount he was asking for nothing seemed more painful to him than to be compelled to take any third party into his confidence in regard to his brother's escape and m de Girousse frightened him more than any one else when the young man called the mansion was closed the count having just left for lambesque his errand was so disagreeable to him that he was almost glad at finding no one at home he remained on the cour irresolute not daring to go to lambesque and in despair at being reduced to an action as he advanced along one of the paths quite upset and with his eyes wandering vaguely about him he met vine it was seven o'clock in the morning the flower girl with her best clothes on had a small travelling bag in her hand and appeared all smiles and determination where are you off to he inquired with surprise i am going to marseilles she answered he looked at her curiously asking for an explanation with his eyes i can tell you nothing she continued i have a plan but am afraid of failure i shall return to-night come never despair marius accompanied fine to the diligence when the heavy vehicle set out he followed it for a long time with his eyes this carriage bore away his last hope and would bring him back joy or anguish up to the evening he watched all the diligences coming in until at length there remained only one to arrive and fine had not yet returned the young man devoured by impatience walked nervously backward and forward trembling lest the flower girl should not return until the following day in his trouble as to what this last attempt might be he felt he had not the courage to pass another whole night of uncertainty and anxiety he walked about the cour shivering and a prey to a sort of nightmare at last he perceived the diligence in the distance in the centre of the rotonde square when he heard the wheels rumbling on the stones his heart beat violently he set his back against a tree and watched the travellers stepping out one by one all at once he felt as if rooted to the spot he had seen the tall form and sad pale face of abbe chastanier appear at one of the open doors of the vehicle almost opposite him when the abbe was on the pavement he extended his hand and helped out a young lady who was none other than mademoiselle blanche de casalis fine lightly sprang to the ground behind her without making use of the step she was beaming with smiles the two travellers guided by fine went off in the direction of the hotel des princes marius who had remained in the shades of early evening followed them in a mechanical manner at a loss to understand as if stultified fine remained ten minutes in the hotel at most as she left she caught sight of the young man and ran towards him in a fit of delight i succeeded in bringing them here she exclaimed clapping her hands and now i trust they will obtain what i want to-morrow we shall be fixed then she took marius's arm and gave him an account of her journey the previous evening she had been struck by something the young man had said about regretting he had not the time before him to earn the amount he required by work on the other hand the anecdotes her uncle had related had shown her that it would be impossible to find a money-lender or usurer disposed to be reasonable the matter was therefore reduced to one of gaining time of delaying as long as possible the moment when philippe would be attached to the pillory what terrified them was this public exhibition and the infamy it carried with it by handing over the condemned to the sneers and insults of the mob from that moment the young girl's plan was formed it was a bold plan which would perhaps succeed by reason of its audacity her intention had been to go straight to m casalis's to penetrate as far as his niece and describe the picture of the public exhibition of philippe pointing out how insulting such a sight would be for her she would persuade her to lend assistance and both would go and implore the deputy to intercede if m de casalis would not consent to ask for pardon he would perhaps try to obtain a postponement fine however did not reason out her plans it seemed to her impossible that blanche's uncle could resist her tears she had faith in her devotedness 
the poor child was dreaming with her eyes wide open and hoping that monsieur de casalis would relent at the last moment this proud and obstinate man had meant to cover philippe with infamy and he would have allowed no obstacle to be placed in the way of his vengeance had she found herself in his path she would have been crushed she would have expended her brightest smiles and most touching tears in pure loss fortunately for her she was assisted by circumstances when she called at the deputy's mansion in the cour bonaparte she was informed that m de casalis had just left for paris on business connected with his political position she then asked to see mademoiselle blanche and was told in a sort of vague manner that the young lady was absent that she was travelling the flower girl felt very much embarrassed but she was obliged to withdraw and to go back and think matters over in the street all her plans were upset this absence of the uncle and niece deprived her of the support on which she had relied and she had not a single friend to whom she could appeal she was determined however that she would not lose her last hope and return to aix as sick at heart as on the previous evening after having made a useless journey all at once she thought of abbe chastanier marius had often spoken to her of the old priest she knew how good and devoted he was perhaps he might be able to give her some valuable information she found him at the house of his sister the old invalided workwoman and unbosoming herself to him explained in a few words the reason of her journey to marseilles the priest listened to her with lively concern it is heaven that has sent you here he answered i think under circumstances such as these that i may violate the secret that has been entrusted to me mademoiselle blanche is not travelling her uncle wishing to hide her condition and being unable to take her to paris has rented a cottage for her in the village of st henri she is living there with a companion m de casalis who has received me back into his good graces and begged me to visit her frequently has given me considerable power over her shall i take you to this poor child whom you will find very much altered and broken down fine accepted joyfully blanche turned quite pale when she saw the flower girl and began to shed warm tears there was a large bluish circle round her eyes the blood had fled from her lips and her cheeks were like white wax one saw that a terrible cry the cry of truth rose within her and made her stagger when fine in a sweet voice accompanied by tender caresses had made her understand that she could perhaps save philippe from supreme humiliation she stood straight up and said in a broken voice i am ready dispose of me i hear a child speaking to me unceasingly of its father i would fain appease the anger of this poor little creature which is yet unborn well continued fine warmly assist us in our work of deliverance i am certain you will obtain at least a respite if you make the attempt but observed abbe chastanier mademoiselle blanche cannot go to aix alone i must accompany her i know that if m de casalis hears of this journey he will load me with bitter reproaches i accept however the responsibility of what i am doing in the belief that i am acting as an upright man as soon as the flower girl had obtained this consent she hardly allowed the old man and young girl sufficient time to get a few things together for the journey she returned to marseilles with them pushed them into the diligence and it was thus that she brought them triumphantly into aix the following day blanche was to pay a visit to the president of the bench of judges who had passed sentence on philippe when fine had concluded her story marius embraced her warmly on both cheeks a proceeding that made a bloom of pink overspread the young girl's forehead chapter nineteen a respite fine called on blanche and abbe chastanier the next morning she wished to accompany them to the door of the president's residence so as to learn the result of their application without a moment's delay marius who understood that his presence would be painful to mademoiselle de casalis began strolling about the cour like a soul in trouble and followed the priest and two young girls at a distance when the supplicants had gone upstairs the flower girl perceived the young man and sighed to him to come and join her they both waited agitated and anxious without exchanging a word the president received blanche with great commiseration he understood that she had received the cruelest of blows in this unfortunate business the poor child could not speak at the first she began to sob and all her supplicating being begged for pity infinitely better than her prayers could have done it was abbe chastanier who had to explain their presence and present their petition sir said he to the president we come with joined hands 
mademoiselle de casalis is already broken down by the misfortunes that have overwhelmed her she implores you for pity's sake to spare her fresh humiliation what would you have me do inquired the president in an unsteady voice we desire if it be possible that you will prevent a fresh scandal m philippe caillole has been sentenced to be publicly exhibited and he is to undergo this punishment within the next few days but the infamy will not attain him alone it will not be a case of one culprit being fastened to the pillory there will be a poor suffering child who now implores your pity you understand do you not the yells and insults of the mob will recoil on mademoiselle de Gazalis. she will be dragged in the mud by the people and her name will be passed from mouth to mouth around the abominable post with sneers of hatred and foul expressions the president seemed deeply affected he preserved silence for a moment then as if struck with a sudden idea he inquired but was it m de cazalis who sent you here is he aware of the steps you are taking no replied the priest with frank dignity m de cazalis does not know we are here men have interests passions that bear them along and which sometimes prevent them forming a clear judgment as to their position perhaps we are acting contrary to the wish of mademoiselle de cazalis's uncle in coming to solicit you but above the passions and interests of men are goodness and justice and so i do not fear to place my sacred character in jeopardy by taking upon myself to ask you to be good and just you are right sir said the president i understand the motives that brought you here and as you see i am deeply affected by your words unfortunately i cannot prevent the punishment it is not within my power to modify a sentence of a court of assizes blanche joined her hands sir she stammered i know not what you can do for me but i implore you to be merciful say to yourself that it is i whom you have sentenced and endeavour to case my sufferings the president took her hands and answered her with parental tenderness my poor child i understand everything the part i have played in this affair has been a painful one at this moment i am in despair at not being able to say to you fear nothing i have the power to overthrow the pillory and you shall not be attached to the post with the condemned man then asked the dejected priest the exhibition will take place shortly you are not even allowed to delay this deplorable scene the president had risen the minister of justice he said can put it off at the request of the crown advocate will you have this exhibition take place at the end of december i shall be glad to give you a proof of my compassion and good will yes yes exclaimed blanche warmly delay the terrible moment as long as possible i shall perhaps feel stronger abbe chastanier who knew what marius's projects were thought that in presence of the president's promise he ought to retire without insisting further so he joined blanche in accepting the offer made them very well that is understood said the president accompanying them to the door i shall make the request and i feel sure it will be granted that justice shall not take its course before the expiration of four months until then rest in peace mademoiselle hope heaven will perhaps send you some balm to your wounds the two supplicants proceeded downstairs as soon as fine perceived them she ran to meet them well she inquired panting for breath as i told you answered abbe chastanier the president cannot prevent the execution of the sentence the flower-girl turned quite pale but the old priest hastened to add he has promised to intercede and to have the date of the exhibition adjourned you have four months before you to labour for the prisoner's welfare marius had approached the little group formed by the two young girls and the abbe in spite of his desire to stand aloof the silent solitary street appeared quite white in the intense heat of the noonday sun grass had sprung up between the bright paving stones and a dog that was giving an airing to its lean spine in the narrow streak of shade which fell from the houses was the only other living thing about when the young man heard the words that fell from abbe chastanier he rushed forward and grasped his hands effusively ah oh, my father he exclaimed in a trembling voice you have brought me back hope and faith since yesterday i had been doubting providence how can i thank you how can i prove to you my gratitude now i feel possessed of invincible courage 
i am certain of saving my brother blanche at the sight of marius had hung her head a warm blush had suffused her cheeks she stood there confused and embarrassed suffering horridly at the presence of this youth who was aware of her perjury and whom her uncle and she had plunged into despair when the young man's joy had somewhat subsided he regretted he had approached the despairing attitude of mademoiselle de casalis aroused his pity my brother has been very guilty he said to her at last pardon him as i pardon you these few words were all he could find he would have liked to have spoken to her of her child to have questioned her as to the lot reserved to this poor little creature to have claimed it in the name of philippe but he saw her so bowed down that he dared not torture her further fine doubtless understood what was passing within him while he walked a few steps with abbe chastanier she said rapidly to blanche remember that i offered you to be a mother to your child now i love you for i see you have a good heart make a sign and i'll hasten to your assistance but apart from that i shall be on the watch for the little creature must not suffer from the folly of its parents blanche's only answer was to silently squeeze the flower-girl's hand big tears were trickling down her cheeks mademoiselle de casalis and abbe chastanier returned at once to marseilles fine and marius hastened to the jail they told robert Egas that they had four months to prepare the escape and the jailer swore he would abide by his word on whatever day and hour they might remind him of it the two young people desired to see philippe before leaving aix so as to let him know what had taken place and tell him to have hope at eleven o'clock in the evening robert Egas conducted them again to the cell philippe who was becoming accustomed to the prison regulations did not seem particularly depressed provided i am spared the disgrace of the public exhibition he said to them i will consent to everything i would rather break my head open against a wall than be fastened to the post of infamy and the following day the diligence brought marius and fine back to marseilles they were about to continue the struggle to which their hearts urged them on a much larger scale than before they were about to dive to the bottom of human misery and behold the bare wounds of a great city abandoned to all the passions of modern industry end of chapters seventeen eighteen and nineteen end of part one part two chapters one and two of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred Visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one m sauvert the master stevedore cadet cougourdan's employer the master stevedore sauvert was a short lively dark man with thick-set powerful limbs his great hooked nose thin lips and elongated visage were expressive of that vainglorious confidence and artful bragging which are the distinctive features of certain types in the south of france brought up in the port a simple labourer in his youth he had saved up his earnings for ten years he raised enormous weights and was possessed of vigorous strength that did wonders he was in the habit of saying he did not fear big men the truth was that this dwarf could have thrashed a giant but he displayed prudence and wisdom in the use he made of his power avoiding quarrels knowing that the tension of his muscles was worth money and that a blow with the fist only brings trouble he lived soberly given up entirely to work and avarice impatient to attain the end he dreamed of at last he had before him the few thousand francs he required to accomplish his object he became a master from one day to another took men into his employ and with folded arms watched them toiling and perspiring from time to time he gave them a little help with a grumble sauvert at the bottom was a downright lazy fellow he had worked out of obstinacy preferring to perform his life's task at one go off and rest later on in the comfortable indolence of a wealthy man now that he had poor wretches to win him a fortune he walked about with his hands in his pockets piling up money waiting until he had amassed a large sum to satisfy his instincts of free and noisy life little by little the avaricious workman became transformed into a wealthy prodigal sauvert was possessed of a tremendous appetite for wealth and pleasure he wished to have plenty of money in order to enjoy himself beyond measure and he desired to do that so as to show he had plenty of money he was urged on by the vanity of a parvenu to make his pleasures fiendishly riotous when he laughed he insisted on all marseilles hearing his peal of merriment 
he now wore clothes fashioned out of fine cloth under which it was easy to distinguish the stiff limbs of the former workman a heavy gold chain was spread out across his waistcoat it was as thick as one's finger and from it hung a bunch of massive charms which seemed almost sufficient to stun an ox on the left hand he wore a gold ring without any stone with patent leather shoes on his feet and a soft felt hat on his head he sauntered up and down the canebiere and round about the port all day smoking a magnificent meerschaum pipe mounted in silver and as he walked along he made the charms dance on his stomach while his eyes wandered over the crowd with a half bantering half kindly expression he was enjoying himself sauvert had little by little entrusted the management of his business to cadet cougourdan whose smart manners pleased him this youth of twenty summers was gifted with an upright and candid mind that gave him positive superiority over the other stevedores the master was delighted at having such a workman at his elbow he appointed him overseer of the men working for him and from that moment was able to make a grand display in marseilles of his natural desires he limited his work to making up his accounts in the morning and pocketing the money that had been earned the existence he had been dreaming of commenced sauvert became a member of a club he gambled but prudently being of opinion that the pleasure derived from the card table is not worth what it costs he wanted his money's worth of amusement and he therefore sought after substantial and lasting enjoyment he dined at the best eating-houses and associated with ladies whom he showed off in public his vanity was deliciously tickled when he was able to lounge on the cushions of a carriage beside a huge silk skirt the lady was nothing the silk gown all he dragged it into private dining-rooms and there threw the windows open so that all the passers-by might see that he was having a rare time with a well-dressed lady and ordering expensive dishes others would have closed the shutters and bolted the door his dream was to kiss his fair companions in a glass house so that the multitude might know that he was wealthy enough to love such pretty creatures he had his own idea of love for a month he had been living in rapture he had met a young woman whose acquaintance tickled his self-esteem this young person was protected by a count and was looked upon as one of the queens of the demi-monde at marseilles she called herself therese armande but was better known by the familiar name of armande when armande placed her little gloved hand in sauvert's huge paw for the first time the master stevedore almost faded with delight this pressure of the hand was exchanged in the allée du melon opposite the door of the house where the lorette resided and the passers-by stopped and turned round at the sight of this man and young woman smiling and bowing to each other sauvert went off bursting with pride and in ecstasies about armand's dress and superior manners he had but one thought that of protecting this person himself supplanting the count and walking about with lace and velvet leaning on his arm he watched for armand and placed himself in her path he fell in love with the luxuriant finery she wore and the perfumery that escaped from her clothes he was proud at getting a bow from her at appearing to be one of her friends and it would certainly not have displeased him to have been thought one of her lovers at length she succumbed he thought it a victory due to the charms of his person for a week his conceit was unbearable he went about casting a look of mocking pity on the people he met in the street when armand was leaning on his arm the pavement seemed too small for him the gentle swaying to and fro in the lady's gait the frou-frou of her skirts threw him into a delirious reverie he was very fond of crinolines which take up a great deal of room and interfere with pedestrian traffic he related his good fortune to every one cadet was one of his first confidants ah if you only knew he said to him the charming person and how she adores me she has everything imaginable at her place carpets curtains glasses you would think yourself in high society upon my word and with all that not in the least proud a good-natured girl with her hand always open yesterday i lunched in her small drawing-room and we then took an open carriage and drove to the prado every one was staring at us it is enough to make you die of joy to be in such a woman's society cadet smiled his dream was to be loved by a robust girl and in his eyes armand had all the appearance of a mechanical doll of a brittle toy which he would have broken between his fingers but he did not wish to annoy his employer 
and so he went into ecstasies with him over the lorette's charms in the evening he gave fine an account of sauveur's follies the flower-girl had resumed her place in her little kiosk on the cour st louis while selling her flowers she kept her eyes on the alert in search of opportunities to come to marius's assistance she had not lost sight of the loan of fifteen thousand francs and each day she built up a new plan dreaming of taxing those whom chance brought near her do you think she inquired one morning of her brother that m sauvert is a man to lend money that's according to circumstances answered cadet he would willingly give a thousand francs to a poor devil on a public square before a crowd of people to make an exhibition of kind-heartedness the flower-girl laughed oh it's not charity that is wanted she answered the lender's left hand must ignore what is done by his right the deuce said cadet that is too disinterested however one can see on the basis of these few words of conversation fine elaborated quite a scheme she believed sauvain was very wealthy and she did not take him for an ill-natured man at heart it would perhaps be possible to get something out of him by making use of armand's influence the flower-girl understood that she must first of all persuade marius to call on the lorette that was the difficult part of the business the young man would firmly refuse would say that there could be nothing in common between him and this woman one day she let armand's name escape her as by accident and was very much surprised to see marius smile and appear to know all about her are you acquainted with the lady she inquired i went to see her once he answered it was philippe who took me there this lady as you term her threw open her reception rooms to her friends once a week and my brother was one of the frequenters of the place faith i was very well received and found a charming hostess there who was exceedingly ladylike and very elegant fine seemed quite sad to hear marius sing armand's praises it appears he continued that things have somewhat changed at her place during the past year they tell me her affairs are very much involved however they say she is extremely clever and has a talent for intrigue if she should happen to come across a simpleton she will easily get out of her difficulties the young girl had recovered from the strange emotion that had got the better of her she adroitly continued to put her plan into execution without undue haste the simpleton is found she said laughing don't you know mrs sauvert cadet's principal slightly answered marius i have sometimes met him walking about the old port in slippers well he has been armand's lover for the last few months and they pretend he has already spent some money with her then fine added in an indifferent tone of voice why don't you go and see armand again you would meet wealthy people there who might assist you in the affair in question m sauvert would perhaps be disposed to help you marius became serious and for a moment was silent he was thinking pooh he exclaimed at last i must not flinch at anything i shall have to call and see that person to-morrow i will explain my visit by speaking of my brother the flower-girl looked the young man in the face with quivering eyelids and above all she continued with a forced laugh don't go and remain at the feet of the enchantress i have often heard tell of her costly and clever style of dress of her wit and the strange power she exercises over men marius who was astonished at his friend's unsteady voice took her hand and examined her with his penetrating eyes what is the matter with you he inquired any one would think i was going to see the devil and that i am a sinner ah oh, my dear fine i am far from thinking of such nonsense i have a solemn task to perform besides look at me well what woman would care for such a baboon the young girl gazed at him and was quite surprised to find him no longer ugly formerly he had seemed frightful now she perceived something like light burst from his countenance and transform his features the young man pressed her hand amicably and she remained quite troubled the following evening marius called on armand in accordance with his determination chapter two a marseillaise lorette armand's origin was shrouded in mystery she pretended she was born in india of a native woman and an english officer she started from that point and related a novel of which she was the heroine to any one who would listen to it she made a wealthy protector who had taken care of her at her father's death responsible for her first fault 
he had brought her up in the greatest refinement on the same principle as that of fattening a fowl in order that it may make a more toothsome dish she delighted in relating this brutally romantic tale thanks to her falsehoods her real history was never known she had one day swooped down on marseilles just like those birds that sent a district rich in all kinds of prey from afar in settling in a commercial centre she displayed extraordinary intelligence from the moment of her arrival she directed her batteries against business men young merchants who shovel money about she understood that these young sparks confined all day in their offices were thirsting for amusement at night and anxious to squander some of the cash they have earned she set her snares with art she began by starting her establishment on an important footing and giving it a sort of aristocratic appearance it was easy for her to vanquish the rivals whom she found already settled in the city those poor fallen daughters of eve were grossly ignorant they dressed badly hardly knew how to speak made a wretched mean show of luxury and gave themselves stupidly away armand crushed them with her elegance and the wit she had picked up here and there in her intercourse with persons in good station of life in a few months she became a sort of mundane celebrity at home as sauvert had naively said she gave herself the airs of a duchess she had displayed admirable taste in furnishing her apartment she threw open her drawing-room and while she attracted the golden youth of the city by her noisy mode of life she retained them by her good graces and air of distinction you could hardly perceive through the mistress of the house the lady of easy virtue she had lovers and was willing enough to show them off but in public and at her evening parties she maintained a decency of demeanour for which they felt very grateful to her she was the emblem of vice witty elegant and perfumed little by little she surrounded herself by most of the fast men of the city but she was careful only to receive wealthy people such as earned a great deal of money and spent still more at the commencement she had only to choose her victims a swarm being at her feet she devoured several fortunes with her sharp teeth living in the utmost luxury and providing for all the requirements of her mode of life which were enormous moral people looked on her as a regular pest as a bottomless pit in which the capital of the young commercial men of marseilles was being engulfed her rivals tore her to bits and accused her of engaging in shameless intrigues they made fun of her thin face of the wrinkles come before their time said she was ugly which was almost true and vowed they could not understand the infatuation of these idiotic men for the creature armand let them talk and quietly reigned for several years she had domineered over them by her mind luxury and the science of an elegant and refined woman men attended her receptions in dress coats and white neckties then without any apparent cause her credit was all at once lost bad fortune came and made holes in her luxuriant existence no doubt she had gone out of fashion and generous protectors were scarce she descended to that semi-state of poverty which is attired in silk and treads on carpets feeling she would roll into the gutter if she did not make an effort to retain her grand apartment she struggled in desperation against her ill luck she understood that her power of fascination came solely from her apparent wealth from her style of dress from the money which permitted her to act the part of a duchess beyond her sphere at her ease she knew that as soon as she was out of silk and had closed her drawing-room she would become a poor girl an ugly faded creature whom no one would have anything to do with and she displayed feverish energy to find protectors and procure money at any cost it was at this time that she made the acquaintance of madame mercier who advanced her money at an exorbitant rate of interest she had taken in so many young simpletons that she allowed herself to be imposed upon in her turn without much ado she hoped however to make the first wealthy individual whom she came across pay the capital and interest of the money she had borrowed but men of wealth did not put in an appearance and she became more and more anxious urged on by necessity and feeling that her beauty which was her breadwinner was leaving her day by day with her luxury she turned to crime she had already been obliged to sell looking-glasses furniture porcelain to satisfy the demands of her creditors her apartment was being stripped of everything she saw the walls getting bare little by little and thought with a shudder of the day when she would find herself weary and old in an empty room the upholsterers milliners all the tradesmen to whom she owed money became more troublesome as they detected their customers approaching ruin 
they knew that protectors were becoming rare and insisted on the immediate payment of their claims some of them talked of putting in the brokers armand therefore understood that she was lost unless she found money at once no matter how she had recourse to an extreme measure she imitated the writing of three or four of her lovers and made out acceptances in her own favour which she signed with these persons names then not daring to go to a banker she applied to madame mercier who consented to discount several of the bills it is probable that this female usurer was not ignorant of their origin and that she even speculated on it holding the young woman in her clutches able at any moment to lodge a complaint with the crown attorney relying moreover on those whose names were on the bills and whose interest it was to avoid a scandal she considered the forgeries she held in guarantee as preferable to genuine bills she based quite a fortune on her complacency exacting enormous interest embroiling the lorette's affairs more and more making her provide for her completely acting a cunning and hypocritical part which she performed to perfection armand managed to get along for two years without being disturbed she had made the bills payable at her residence and provided the money for them when they fell due at any cost taking a hundred francs from the first man she met completing the amount by selling something borrowing again and forging fresh bills madame mercier continued to be humble and obliging she desired to hold her prey in a close grip before showing her teeth and biting then the time came when armand was positively unable to meet the forged acceptances she cast herself into the gutter in vain she went to the chateau des fleurs and still could not make the money she required to keep up her house it was just then that she made sauveur's acquaintance for him she dismissed accounts she had ruined under the impression that the master stevedore was rich and generous in other times when she was queen of marseilles and insolently displayed her lace and velvet she would have gazed down on sauveur from the height of the wealth and elegance of her admirers but now there was no prey that she disdained she set her batteries against the crowd and would willingly have received money from soiled hands the former workman mistook the dire necessity which thrust the young woman into his arms for tenderness after a few months she perceived with alarm that her new acquaintance had all the prudent economical habits of an upstart and that he spent all his money on himself like an egotist two or three of the forged acceptances were not met and madame mercier began to get angry things were at that point when one evening marius naively called he expected to meet some of the numerous wealthy company in her drawing-room to whom his brother had introduced him he had a vague idea of getting intimate with some young business man who would come to his assistance and he relied in a measure on sauveur whose obliging disposition fine had been careful to exaggerate he was very much astonished to find the drawing-room empty the large apartment was lit with a single lamp and appeared particularly bare sauveur was reclining on a large divan and seemed to be making a great fuss about digesting the dinner he had just eaten undoing some of the buttons of his waistcoat and holding a toothpick between his fingers armand was seated beside him in an armchair reading graziella with her forehead resting dreamily on the palm of her left hand an italian greyhound named jali was lying at her feet with its head reposing on her cherry-coloured slippers one of armand's ways of seduction was to read the works of great modern poets before her admirers she had a small bookcase containing the writings of chateaubriand victor hugo de lamartine and alfred de musset in the evening in the pale light of the lamp at an hour when she was still beautiful she languidly spelt over pages of verse or poetical prose this placed a sort of halo round her head her admirers thought they had an ignorant girl to deal with and they found an educated almost a lettered lady who read books that they had never had either the time or energy to look into sauveur especially felt crushed and overshadowed on the day when his lady friend took up a book of verses and quietly began turning over the pages of it before him it was a rare event with him when he glanced through a newspaper a woman opening a volume of poetry was in his eyes a superior creature each time armand read in his presence he collected himself and looked affected and charmed it seemed to him that he was becoming wise himself marius slightly smiled when he saw armand in an inclined attitude feigning ecstasy and the position sauveur was in lounging on the divan with his hands clasped across his stomach the lorette welcomed the newcomer with her easy sprightly grace she had been more or less intimately connected with philippe and she treated marius as an old acquaintance 
she asked him to be seated and reproached him with the rarity of his visits i know very well she added that you have had a great deal of trouble lately poor philippe i can fancy sometimes that i see him in his damp prison he who was so fond of luxury and pleasure that will teach him to place his affection in better hands sauvert had raised himself a little one of his good qualities was that he was not jealous on the contrary he showed himself quite proud of his companion's pest admirers the fondness which armand had formerly shown for others doubled in his eyes the value of his good fortune besides marius seemed to him so small that he was delighted to appear robust beside of him the young woman introduced the two men oh we know each other said the master stevedore with the laugh of a happy man i also know m philippe Cayolle. there's a fine fellow for you the truth was that sauvert was delighted at being found alone with armand he began to talk to her familiarly to lay stress on the pleasures they participated in together and then resumed speaking of philippe he often came to see you didn't he ah never mind don't protest i think you were in love with each other i used to meet him sometimes at the chateau des fleurs we went there yesterday eh my dear what a crowd what dresses he turned to marius in the evening he added we supped at a restaurant it is very expensive it is not every one who can afford that armand seemed to suffer there was still some delicacy about the woman she looked at marius shrugged her shoulders slightly shot glances at him scoffing at sauvert the latter remained imperturbable and stretched himself out full of enjoyment marius then guessed how much the lorette was embarrassed and tormented he felt something like pity at the sight of her deserted drawing-room and when he understood down what a frightfully steep incline this woman whom he had known happy and without a care was rolling he regretted having called about ten o'clock he found himself alone with sauvert who began to give him an account of his good fortune and joyous existence a servant had come to tell armand that madame mercier was in the antechamber and that she seemed very angry End of chapters one and two part two chapters three and four of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three in which madame mercier shows her claws madame mercier was a little round fat old woman of fifty who was forever tearfully complaining about the hardness of the times attired in a gown of washed-out printed calico always with an old straw basket on her arm which served as a safe she trotted along with short steps and the sly movements of a cat she was humble and wretched and gave herself poverty-stricken airs to make people pity her her fresh complexion and the wrinkles on her face resembling rolls of fat were a standing protest against the tears that inundated it at every moment this female usurer played her part admirably with armand she first of all acted the good-natured woman she gained absolute control over her with an infernal kind of art showing herself in turn serviceable and egotistic embroiling the accounts allowing the interest to accumulate making it impossible for her debtor to verify anything thus when one of the acceptances fell due and armand was without funds to meet it madame mercier was greatly distressed then she promised to borrow the money from some one vowing she had not got it herself she advanced the amount of the bill but made the lorette immediately reimburse her and thus there was fresh interest to pay in all this coming and going of acceptances in the constant increase in the rate of discount armand had lost all count of how she stood what she had paid and what she still owed in the meantime the debt increased without the usurer making any farther advances and the older it became the more obscure it got the young woman felt herself lost at the bottom of chaos the female usurer maintained her despairing and coaxing manner when she supplied money herself in order that armand might pay her she made her feel all her devotedness all the heroism of her conduct eh hey, you have never seen a creditor like me she would say i even go so far as to borrow the money you want that is splendid that is but answered armand it's for yourself that you borrow the money as i give it to you not at all answered the old woman i am only seeking to do you a service so madame mercier in this way introduced herself little by little into the house 
every two or three days she came and showed her cunning coaxing face armand became her property her slave sometimes she arrived all in a flutter fell into a chair in despair and accused the young woman of wanting to run away without paying her it was necessary to take her over to the apartment and let her see that the trunks were not packed up sometimes she rang violently at the door said she had been robbed and reproached the lorette with her expenditure she compared the one life with the other accused her debtor of being insolvent and crippled with debt and ended by asking for fresh security at other moments she came suddenly and demanded money then she softened down pleaded poverty and on leaving shuffled along in a most lamentable way she accompanied each of these visits with a deluge of tears these came at her bidding and she took advantage of that circumstance to embarrass people each complaint was followed by a sob she twisted herself about pitifully on a chair uttering the least word in a doleful tone of voice armand weary and bewildered generally stood before her without being able to pronounce a syllable at times she would have sacrificed everything linen gowns furniture to have been freed from these continual lamentations the usurer invented another kind of persecution she would come with red eyes declare she was in want of bread and was dying the young woman aggravated and quite out of patience would tell her to sit down and eat sometimes she would shed streams of tears to get sugar coffee or brandy alas my dear lady she snivelled i am very unhappy this morning i had to take my coffee without sugar and to-morrow i shall have neither sugar nor coffee be charitable it is you who have brought me to this if you were to give me my money i should not be obliged to come and beg for pity's sake let me have a few pounds of coffee and sugar that will count for all the services i have rendered you armand did not dare refuse she spent her last few sous trembling in the presence of certain savage bantering looks of her creditor if she happened to say she had no money the usurer would answer very well i shall present the bill you gave me to your lover the other would not allow her to proceed any further she sent and sold something and purchased what her tormentor required the unfortunate girl closed her eyes in order not to see the chasm gaping before her she belonged to this woman who held such terrible proofs against her in her hands and she obeyed her inwardly irritated inquiring of herself with despair by what means she could escape from her claws madame mercier wept for nearly two years and extracted from armand all she could she never went away with empty hands the money she had lent her already brought her in two hundred and fifty per cent if the capital was compromised the interest covered it two or three times over at last the usurer understood that she must change her tactics armand could not receive her without a nervous shudder which must inevitably bring about a crisis besides she had no money and she had twice firmly refused to give her sugar from that moment the old woman resolved to weep no more but to have recourse to strong measures it only remained to her to play all for all to exact immediate payment of the arrears from the lorette by threatening to lodge a complaint with the crown attorney she had had the prudence not to manifest the least suspicion anent the forged bills in her possession her plan was soon formed she decided she would call on the young woman and put her in a fearful fright if one of her protectors happened to be there she would apply to him she would create a scandal and manage to get back her money somehow she wanted to devour her prey after having sucked all the blood from her veins an acceptance for a thousand francs which armand had signed with sauveur's name and which she had given madame merci in exchange for another bill had fallen due on the previous day the old woman having a pretext to be angry resolved not to wait any longer she called on the young woman just at the time when marius and the master stevedore were there armand was quite troubled when she met her in the antechamber she dragged her to the farthest corner of a small boudoir which was only separated from the drawing-room by the thin door she offered her a seat with the timid and beseeching look of an insolvent person to her creditor what do you mean shouted the usurer refusing the chair you are making fun of me my good lady another bill returned unpaid i am tired of it all she had crossed her arms and spoke in a loud insolent voice her little fat red face shone with anger armand would have preferred to have seen her crying and lamenting in her customary drawling tone of voice for mercy's sake she exclaimed frightened speak lower i have visitors 
you know in what an embarrassing position i find myself grant me a few days grace madame mercier made a movement of impatience she stood on tiptoe and spoke right in the lorette's face what care i if you have visitors she continued without lowering her voice i mean to be paid and immediately madame wears hats and bonnets madame goes to the chateau des fleurs madame has lovers who provide all sorts of amusement for her have i any lovers i deprive myself i eat dry bread and drink water whereas you stuff yourself with good things that can't last i must have my money or i will take you somewhere you know where don't you she accompanied these words with a threatening look and armand turned quite pale ah that ruffles you continued the old woman sneering you must have taken me for a donkey if i have acted like one it was no doubt because it was to my interest to do so she began laughing and shrugging her shoulders then she added violently if you don't pay me to-night i will write to-morrow to the crown attorney i don't know what you mean stammered armand the old woman sat down she felt she was mistress of the situation and she wanted to enjoy the pleasure of playing for a moment with her prey ah you don't know what i mean when i speak to you of the crown attorney she said making a frightful grimace as if overcome with sudden merriment but you lie my good lady look at yourself in that glass you are pallid own that you're a hussy at that word armand rose it seemed to her that she had just received a cut with a whip across the face her self-possession returned to her and showing madame mercier the door she exclaimed in a loud voice walk out at once no i'll not go out answered the old woman sitting back in the armchair i want my money if you touch me i'll shout murder and the persons who are in your drawing-room will come to my assistance i told you i was not a fool pay me at once and i'll leave you alone i have no money answered armand coldly this reply exasperated the old woman for more than a year it had been given her regularly at each of her visits she had ended by taking it for mockery you have no money you always say that she exclaimed give me your furniture and gowns but no i prefer sending you to prison i will go and lodge a complaint i will accuse you of forgery we shall see my beautiful lady if you find lovers among your jailers who will treat you to silk gowns and tasty meals armand staggered losing all her assurance fearing the cries of the old woman might be heard by marius and sauvaire her creditor saw her fright and began shouting still louder yes she said i can send you to the assizes to-morrow you know that don't you i have over ten false acceptances in my possession on which you have imitated your lover's signatures that's nice work i shall go and find each of these gentlemen i will tell them what you are and they will cast you into the street you will die in the gutter she took breath while the young woman all of a tremble thought of strangling her to make her silent but that reminds me she continued you have visitors perhaps in your drawing-room there is one of these gentlemen whose name you have stolen to make money out of i'll go and see it is necessary i should find out let me pass she moved towards the door armand placed herself in front of her with extended arms ready to strike her if she advanced you want to strike me i who have fed you who have lent you my money stammered the female usurer suffocating with rage and she stepped backward shouting help help armand faced sharply round to turn the key in the lock but it was too late the door had just opened and she found herself face to face with marius and sauvaire who were gazing into the boudoir in an anxious and curious manner chapter four which shows that the position of a lorette is not without its troubles sauvaire and marius had been about half an hour alone in the drawing-room the young man would willingly have withdrawn but he considered it uncivil to do so without first of all taking leave of the mistress of the house he therefore feigned to be listening to the stevedore stories the sound of loud voices soon reached them little by little the noise increased to such a pitch that both of them lent the ear being unable to appear discreet any longer just then the shout 
help help made them start up and open the door communicating with the boudoir a strange sight awaited them as soon as they made their appearance armand stepped back staggering and let herself fall into an armchair with her head between her hands she burst out sobbing quite broken down without raising her face or uttering a word the old woman in a rage with inflamed countenance approached the two men and began speaking to them with passionate verbosity from time to time she broke off to turn round and shake her fist at armand who was so upset by despair which made her tremble all over her body that she did not hear her you saw it, did you not repeated the old woman she wanted to beat me she had her arm in the air ah oh, the wretch just fancy my good gentleman i have given that woman all my money i like to be of service besides i thought she was honest she has made me discount acceptances signed by honourable persons i thought i had good security now i learn that the bills are false and that i have been shamefully robbed what would you have done in my place i reproached her with her abominable conduct and then she threatened to strike me Silvère opened his eyes in astonishment gazing first of all at armand's dejection and then at madame mercier's anger he approached the young woman and exclaimed come my dear defend yourself this woman lies doesn't she you have not done anything so stupid come speak armand did not move but continued sobbing oh she'll not speak she'll not defend herself continued the woman usurer in triumph she knows very well that i am in possession of the proofs i shall write to-morrow morning to the crown attorney marius painfully surprised cast a look of pity on armand chance had brought him face to face with another shame another human misery he remembered the sad scene when charles blaitrie was arrested in his presence and a feeling of mercy overcame him in face of this woman whom vice had brought to infamy he half guessed the circumstances that had urged her on to crime he understood how necessity from fall to fall had brought her to the gutter he would have liked to have saved her to have brought her back to a life of honesty to have given her the means of extricating herself from the sewer why do you wish to ruin her he quietly inquired of the old woman you will not be paid any the quicker don't overwhelm her on the contrary give her a chance to recover herself and pay you back no no mercilessly answered the old woman i want her to go to prison i have waited too long already yesterday again she failed to meet a bill of a thousand francs which she had made payable here she signed that bill sauvert the name of one of her admirers no doubt the master stevedore on hearing himself referred to started the sum of a thousand alarmed him you say you have an acceptance of a thousand francs signed sauvert he inquired with an appearance of something very much like terror yes sir answered the old woman i brought it with me it is in my basket show it me if you please sauvert turned the bill over in his fingers studying the handwriting very closely and was confounded by jupiter he exclaimed it's perfectly imitated he leant over towards armand who was doubled up with grief and continued in a dry tone of voice look here my dear no nonsense i will never pay that you know the deuce i'd willingly give you a hundred francs but a thousand it's too much he no longer spoke familiarly to her he even began to regret his excursion into the demi-monde of marseilles oh that's not the only one i've got continued madame mercier i've many others in my possession bearing different names however if this one were paid i would agree not to say anything i would continue to wait marius's sensible remarks had made her understand that it would be better not to lodge a complaint and as she had sauvert beside her she was in hopes he would pay she became quite tender changed her plans and began to excuse armand after all she said i don't know that the other bills are false the poor little woman has had a rough time you must not be angry with her sir she is a very good person at heart and she began to shed warm tears marius could not restrain a smile sauvert walked up and down excited grumbling angrily 
he cared very little about armand's infamous conduct he was simply irritated at the struggle between egotism and generosity that was taking place within him no decidedly he exclaimed at last i can do nothing armand buried in her armchair continued sobbing in a low broken-hearted manner this woman who had known all the delight of luxury and adoration suffered bitterly at having fallen so low there she was degraded with her misery and shame brought home to her and she was seized with despair when her thoughts went back to her elegance and wealth of former times she would never rise again she would fall still lower become the last of creatures and she was all the more upset at the thought that her disgrace would be public the presence of sauveur and marius gave her additional pain her silent grief produced a strange effect on marius who was weak in the presence of tears he would willingly have given the old woman her thousand francs if he had had them after a painful silence he addressed sauveur who was taking great strides about the room very much annoyed come sir he said to him this woman must be saved her own sobs plead her cause better than i could do you are fond of her and will not abandon her in her despair eh hey, yes i was fond of her answered the master stevedore sharply and i think i have shown it sufficiently during the last three months do you know that i have already spent nearly five thousand francs with her i'll give no more so much the worse she must get out of it as she can it would be a thousand francs thrown into the street what enjoyment shall i have for this money if i give it to her you will have done a good action her behaviour is scandalous and i'm not trying to excuse her only i think i can guess how it was she became a forger and i could plead her cause oh all that has nothing to do with me she did what she pleased you see i am not angry i am simply going to place myself beyond all this disagreeable business marius was getting discouraged he remembered what fine had related to him about the master stevedore's vanity and he continued in a careless way let's say no more about it i spoke to you thus because i knew you were very rich and very generous sooner or later the account of your good action would have been mooted abroad and you would have won in this affair more than a thousand francs worth of praise do you think so asked sauveur hesitating i am certain few men would be so generous and for that reason it would be positively glorious to save this woman but let us say no more about it sauveur ceased walking about he stopped in the centre of the room and began to think madame mercier who saw him hesitating and who was experiencing thrills of desire at the idea of receiving a thousand francs thought she had better intervene she had resumed her cheerful voice and her humble gentle manner ah sir she said to sauveur if you only knew how this poor little woman adores you there are very wealthy men who have tried to take your place she has refused all offers and it is perhaps that which has placed her in straitened circumstances and prevented her repairing the faults she has committed you cannot imagine how closely she clings to you the master stevedore felt very much flattered at these remarks from the moment his self-esteem was in question the matter bore a different complexion very well be it so he said i'll give the thousand francs i'll take them to you to-morrow evening now withdraw leave madame alone the old woman bowed with servile humility and went quietly away closing the doors without the least noise armand had raised her head her face flushed with tears seemed to have grown older all upset with fright and feverish with shame she rose with difficulty and wanted to kneel down before marius and sauveur the young man held her up whilst the master cibador said come my dear it's all over i accept your thanks and trust my good action will be profitable to you the truth was that sauveur no longer found any charm in armand he had just perceived that the poor creature was faded and he had received too hard a lesson to forget himself any longer in the boudoirs of the demi-monde he began to prefer the grisette the two men withdrew and at the door armand warmly kissed marius's hand she saw that he felt real and profound pity for her and she thanked him for having saved her the following night sauveur called to fetch marius to accompany him to madame mercier's the female usurer occupied a filthy house in the rue du pavé d'amour 
the two visitors ascended three flights of stairs and knocked without obtaining an answer at a black and damp door the noise they made brought out a neighbour who informed them that the wicked old woman had been arrested that morning the police said this person had been on her track for some days it seems a complaint had been lodged against her all the tenants were delighted at her arrest she only just had time to burn the papers likely to compromise her marius understood that armand had been saved by providence he made inquiries of the people at the house and acquired the certitude that the old woman had burnt all the acceptances signed by the lorette fearing that their possession might constitute other charges against her for she guessed that if armand found herself implicated she would tell the truth and give the most overwhelming details besides by destroying the security she lost nothing as she had long since recovered her advances sauvert was particularly delighted at their adventure he carried off the thousand francs triumphantly he had been enabled to give a proof of his generosity without spending a sou it was all profit you are a witness that i was going to give the money he said to marius that is how i am i like to be generous i throw money out of the window oh a gift of a thousand francs does not trouble me when it's a question of paying for my amusement marius allowed him to expatiate on his good qualities and ran off to armand to tell her the good news he found the young woman sad and troubled she had passed an atrocious night struggling mentally with her misfortunes in search of a supreme means of extricating herself from the infamy in which she was plunged when she learned that the forged acceptances had been destroyed that she had recovered her liberty she was as if transformed she kissed marius passionately and vowed to him that she would take advantage of the lesson and change her mode of life i will work she said i will conduct myself like a respectable woman then only will i ask you to return me your friendship good-bye marius left her quite moved by her decision and promises when he was alone he reproached himself with his abnegation for two days he had been living beyond himself without giving a thought to his brother's safety when fine inquired the result of his errand he did not dare to relate to her the dramatic scenes at which he had been present he limited himself to telling her that there was no hope of borrowing the money from sauvert and that armand was closing her drawing-room where will you go now then inquired the flower-girl i know not he answered however i have a plan which i am going to put into execution End of chapters 3 and 4part two chapters five and six of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred Vizitelli. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five douglas the notary marius had returned to m martelli's and resumed his duties finding a sort of peacefulness in his work his thoughts ran freer amidst the silence and calm of his office he told himself that he had four months and wished to come to philippe's assistance and he would reflect for hours together as to the best means to be employed m martelli continued to treat him as he would a son sometimes the young man thought of telling him everything and of borrowing the fifteen thousand francs of him but a fear a timidity prevented him he dreaded his employer's republican sternness so he resolved to continue the struggle to exhaust all possible means before applying to the shipowner later on when he had unsuccessfully tried everything else he would make up his mind to tell him of his difficulty and implore his kind assistance meanwhile he determined he would not again behave like a simpleton and take any useless steps for a moment he thought of earning the necessary amount himself the high figure frightened him and he saw very well that he could never put by such a sum in four months yet he felt bold enough to move mountains it recurred to him that douglas the notary whose aid m martelli had vainly asked for philippe had for some months past been offering to employ him as agent acting under power of attorney for some of his clients the notary and the shipowner were connected in various business matters and m martelli often sent marius to settle different accounts with douglas one day on calling there the young man decided to accept the offer that had been made him if the profits were small he might when he had become better known succeed in obtaining a loan the notary lived in a house of simple and austere appearance the offices occupied the entire first floor there was quite a crowd of clerks seated along stained deal tables in the large cold bare rooms 
luxury had never penetrated into those rooms full of prodigious activity and a kind of honest roughness one felt oneself to be in the abode of a man who never forgot himself amid the joys of life about ten years before douglas had succeeded to the practice of a person named imbert whose clerk he had been for more than twelve years he was then an intelligent and active young fellow with a passion for business and ever dreaming of monster speculations the fever for trade and manufacture that was passing over france heated his blood and filled him with strong ambition he wished to earn vast sums of money not in order to live in opulence but because he tasted a keen voluptuousness in unravelling all monetary matters and in guiding the undertakings he embarked upon to success at the outset he felt himself too restricted in his notary's practice he was a born banker and his hands were formed for manipulating large sums of money his profession with its quiet dealings and almost sacred and paternal character did not in the least suit his stock-jobbing nature he felt out of his element for all his instincts urged him to turn the money deposited with him to account he could not reconcile himself to being a disinterested intermediary and he launched into panting and fever speculations which later on turned him into a great criminal he paid the purchase money of his practice in a few months without any one knowing how he had obtained the necessary capital then he displayed febrile activity in a very short time his practice developed considerably he became the first notary of marseilles opening his doors wide and securing fresh clients every day his mode of proceeding was extremely simple he never denied himself to any client and listened to every application he always found money for those who wanted to borrow and always had excellent investments for those who deposited their cash with him a considerable turnover of capital thus took place through the intermediary of his office at first people were surprised at his rapid success they talked of imprudence and considered that the young notary was going too quickly ahead and was undertaking a burden too heavy for his shoulders besides this no one could make out how he managed to meet the calls occasioned by the continual increase of his practice but douglas calmed public anxiety by the simplicity of his life he was believed to be very wealthy yet he dressed quietly displayed not the slightest luxury and denied himself all pleasures every one knew that he led a sober existence eating only plain food living in fact like a petty shopkeeper he was also very pious gave a great deal in charity went to church and remained kneeling during the whole length of the service by these means he acquired the reputation of an honest man and this went on increasing daily he came to be cited at last as a model of piety and honour his name was respected and beloved it had taken him barely six years to arrive at this position and now during six years he had been at the head of the marseilles notaries his office was the most frequented and the one that did the most business wealthy people made a point of employing this modest and pious man endowed with every virtue the nobility and clergy supported him the commercial world had ended by feeling unlimited confidence in his loyalty the position was won and douglas was feverishly turning it to account he was then about forty-five years old a strong thick-set man inclined to stoutness his face always clean-shaven was deathly pale the flesh seemed inanimate the eyes alone showing signs of life he looked like a verger turned banker beneath his gentle exterior one could hear a kind of muffled roar no doubt the blood was coursing fiercely in this struggler's body which seemed to sleep when he conversed in his drawling tones his voice occasionally rose to a pitch which revealed the internal fever consuming him he was always to be found in his private room a cold apartment poorly furnished there was generally a priest or a nun in the antechamber the door was left open and it was easy for any one to find the chief he displayed his charity contempt for luxury and austere good-nature even rather too complacently marius felt a real sympathy for this man whose simple virtues quite won his heart he delighted in calling upon him on this particular day after discussing with douglas the business upon which m martelli had sent him the young man added hesitatingly i wish now sir to speak to you on a private matter only i am afraid i may be trespassing on your time not at all my dear friend said the notary cordially i am quite at your service i have already offered you my assistance and my house is open to you i remember your kind offers and i wish to remind you of what you said to me some months ago 
i told you that it only rested with yourself to earn some money with me i should like to assist a young fellow like you by putting your willingness and courage to the proof what i told you then i repeat to-day i thank you and accept replied marius simply much affected by douglas's frank and generous ways the latter on hearing the young man's words started with joy he turned his chair round quickly and indicated another seat to his visitor sit down and let us talk he said i can only give you a few minutes i like young men such as you not afraid of work and speaking their minds freely you do not know how happy you make me by placing me in the position to be useful to you he smiled and every word he uttered was like a caress well this is the matter in question he continued as some of my clients do not reside at marseilles i have had to find a means of facilitating their transactions i have therefore obtained several agents acting under power of attorney to represent the absent parties and who look after these persons properties whenever one of my clients is for some reason or other unable to attend personally to his affairs he leaves me with a blank power of attorney depending on me to find some upright party who will faithfully fulfil his duties i know that you are an active and honest fellow and i offer you the position of representing two or three landlords whose powers of attorney i have by me there is only your name to fill in and you will receive five per cent upon all the transactions you carry out he spoke in a calm and simple tone of voice marius was frightened at the responsibility of such a position but he felt so sure of his uprightness that he did not hesitate to accept i am at your commands he said to douglas you must guide and advise me i know i shall have nothing to fear in obeying you in everything so as not to overwhelm you at the outset resumed the notary rising i will entrust you with two powers of attorney to begin with he took some papers and returned to his table where he read out the two documents after having filled in marius's name the powers conferred were practically unlimited the right to sell and buy mortgage and bring or defend actions when the notary had finished reading he added i must now give you some information respecting the persons you are to represent he handed marius one of the documents and went on this to begin with is the authorization of my friend and client m hautier of lambesque he is just now at cherbourg and will be shortly starting for new york to take possession of a large fortune that has been left him he purchased at marseilles before his departure a building in the rue de rome you will administer the property during his absence i am expecting to receive his instructions to-morrow and i will inform you of them he then took up the other document and continued and this is the authorization of m moutet a retired merchant at toulon who entrusted me with the capital necessary for taking a mortgage on a country house in the st just district he has just remitted a further sum which he wishes to have invested in the same way but as he is a great sufferer from gout he has asked me to find some one who acting under his power of attorney would give the necessary signatures in his stead come back to-morrow and we can then arrange finally about the two matters douglas rose as a hint that the interview was at an end at the door he shook marius's hand with rough and cordial familiarity the young man withdrew rather stunned by the rapidity of what had taken place he was surprised at the facility with which the notary had entrusted him with such important matters and felt ill at ease at the thought of the heavy responsibility about to weigh upon him chapter six marius seeks unsuccessfully for a house and a man marius called on douglas the next day to receive his final instructions come you're punctual said the notary smiling you'll see we shall do plenty of business together i intend to make you rich sit down i'll attend to you in a minute douglas was lunching at the corner of his table he was eating stale bread with a few nuts and drinking plain water this frugality impressed marius and removed the uneasiness he had hitherto felt such a sober man could not lead him into shady transactions he was undoubtedly a heart in the right place an upright soul a sincere and pious mind devoted to its duty like a priest devotes himself to god now let's talk said the notary when he had finished his repast i have received a letter from m hautier who wishes to raise money on his house as he requires funds for his journey here's his letter 
marius took the paper that douglas held out to him as he appeared to be looking for the post-office stamps the notary said hastily the letter was enclosed in a large envelope which contained several other documents the young man coloured up fearing he had wounded his new employer's feelings he read m Autier's letter which indeed asked to have money raised on the house in the rue de rome he instructed douglas to make use of the power of attorney and to remit him the money at the earliest possible moment when marius had finished reading the letter the notary resumed this request for a loan comes at the right moment for m moutet has again been asking me to find him a safe and advantageous investment as you are now the authorized representative of both my clients the lender and the borrower you will be able to satisfy them both at once you have simply to give me your signature and i will transmit to m Autier the cash that m moutet sent me for investment marius thought douglas was settling matters rather quickly he would have liked to have seen the building and to have exchanged at least a letter or two with the persons he was to represent he did not doubt the notary's good faith but he was unable to get rid of some vague and inexplicable fear his uneasiness of the day before was returning it seemed to him that he was descending into some black hole and douglas's smiles and soft voice troubled him strangely he could not define the peculiar sensation that was creeping over him he felt a need of reaction the notary was already sorting out the documents which he required marius to sign ah the deuce said he stopping suddenly there's one paper wanting i must send a clerk to the mortgage office for it douglas seemed very much put out marius as though urged on by some instinct and obeying the feeling of uneasiness which had taken possession of him rose hastily i cannot wait he said i ought already to be at m martelli's put off the signing of the documents please until monday the day after to-morrow very well said the notary after a moment's hesitation i would rather have finished the matter to-day you know in what a hurry m Autier is however come on monday marius breathed more freely when he found himself in the street he thought he had been childish and felt ashamed of the vague suspicions he had entertained he had almost run off under the spell of some indefinable feeling and he shrugged his shoulders after the manner of a person who had been frightened of his shadow he was glad however to have two days during which he could think matters over and account for his repugnance and overcome it during the afternoon he received a visit at m martelli's office which delighted him m de girousse who was killing time by visiting all the towns of the department called upon him he had just reached marseilles and was leaving the same evening ah my dear friend said he to the clerk how lucky you are to be poor and have to work for your living you've no idea how bored i feel if i could i would change places with your brother i think i should enjoy myself more in prison marius smiled at the old count's strange ideas whilst the latter continued philippe's trial helped to keep me going for a month i never before assisted at such a fine spectacle of human misery and folly i had a violent desire when in court to get up and say all i thought they would no doubt have put me into a straight waistcoat lambesque is becoming uninhabitable ever since m de Girousse had put in an appearance marius had been thinking of asking him to give him some information respecting m Autier. he thought the count must surely know this man who belonged to the same little town as himself according to what douglas had said he attempted to assume an indifferent air as he observed but there are some rich people at lambesque you might cultivate their society and amuse yourself more do you know m Autier, a landlord in your neighbourhood i believe m Autier, repeated the old nobleman trying to remember m Autier, i can recall no one of that name at lambesque and you say the gentleman owns property there yes he has recently bought a house at marseilles and he must have a pretty extensive estate close to your own m de girousse was still thinking hard you must be mistaken he said at length i certainly know no m Autier. i am certain there's no landlord in lambesque of that name for i amused myself by learning the names of all the persons in the place one has to do something come let's understand each other resumed marius turning pale i mean a m Autier who has just come into a large fortune he is at the present time at cherbourg and is about to leave for new york where the relative whose sole heir he is died 
the count burst out laughing what yarns that you're telling me he exclaimed if such a thing were to happen at lambesque if one of my neighbours were to inherit the fortune of a rich uncle in america do you think i should know nothing about it and that i should not amuse myself during a whole week with the gossip such a romance would produce in my little town i assure you again that there has never been an hautier at lambesque and that nobody there has ever inherited the mythical fortune you talk of marius felt quite crushed the count's words carried conviction with them and douglas alone could be the liar in all this the young man did not dare express all he was thinking what interest have you in this monsieur hautier asked m de girousse whose curiosity was excited none at all replied marius stammering one of my friends told me about him and i must have mistaken the name of the town he mentioned he still hesitated to accuse douglas and there was a buzzing sensation in his head which prevented his judging the matter clearly it was in an absent-minded way that he clasped the hand m de girousse held out to him with the words well good-bye come to me at the opening of the shooting season it'll amuse me when the count had gone marius remained in a painful state of perplexity he must certainly have misunderstood yet m de girousse's statements were clear and decisive m hautier was not known at lambesque and therefore douglas had lied for some reason or other the young man did not dare fathom the consequences of this falsehood he divined the existence of several pitfalls beneath his feet and could account for the uneasiness he had experienced when with the notary having at present nothing more than suspicions he promised himself that he would discover the whole truth before engaging further in the matter and giving his signature he understood how serious the least accusation would be and he decided to act with extreme prudence without haste and without showing his mistrust the morrow was a sunday and marius having a free day before him went the first thing in the morning to the rue de rome where the property hautier was supposed to have purchased was situated it was a large handsome house let out in flats to different persons armed with his power of attorney marius skilfully questioned each of the tenants and was soon convinced that not one of them knew m hautier nor had even ever seen him and that all of them had up till then dealt directly with douglas the notary the young man's suspicions were being confirmed he thought he would put them to a final test and went to see the former owner of the building whose address one of the tenants gave him his name was landrol and he lived in an adjoining street sir said marius i am instructed by m hautier to administer the property you sold him and i wish you to give me some information concerning the leases you granted and the rent you charged m landrol obligingly placed himself at his disposal and answered all his inquiries marius was very circumspect and when he had spoken of one thing and another he cleverly broached the real object of his visit very many thanks he said and i regret to have taken up so much of your time my excuse is that i had not been able to see m hautier who is at present away it occurred to me that as you have had dealings with him you could tell me something about him and give me some idea as to what his intentions were but i never treated directly with m hautier landrel replied simply i have never even seen the gentleman the affair was carried through m douglas who furnished me with all the necessary signatures ah i thought m hautier had inspected the building which is the usual custom not at all don't you know that he has been in america for the last six months m douglas inspected the house himself and bought it for his client whose instructions he had received marius bit his lip he had almost allowed his terrible secret to escape him the day before the notary had told him that hautier had come from lambesque to seek and purchase a house the falsehood was now an absolute certainty hautier could not be at the same time away in america where he had been for the past six months and also awaiting money at cherbourg no doubt the individual was no more known at cherbourg or new york than he was at lambesque he was a pure fiction an imaginary puppet whom douglas had conjured up for some criminal design of his own and marius suddenly thought that the power of attorney filled up with his name was in reality a forgery which rendered the forger liable to a sentence of penal servitude he blushed as though he were himself the culprit and muttered some further thanks to landrel who was eyeing him curiously surprised to find him so badly informed as to the affairs of the person he was representing when marius found himself alone in the street 
he was obliged to submit to the evidence of his senses only douglas could have forged the document he had in his pocket yet the young man could not exactly understand the reason of the crime the purchase money of the building had been paid so the only explanation he could hit upon was that the notary had acquired the property for himself under an assumed name in order to disguise the amount of his fortune but even then the crime was still there douglas the pious and upright man was a forger marius feared for a time that moutet the retired toulon merchant was also a dummy he hastened to call on one of his friends who had resided a long time at toulon and breathed more freely when on questioning him he learnt that moutet really existed and was one of douglas's clients after this still prompted by his suspicions he decided to see the property upon which moutet held a mortgage he had spent this morning in uselessly seeking a man and he employed his afternoon in hunting for a house brought up in the st just district in his mother's country house marius knew all the residences of the neighbourhood the property upon which douglas professed to hold a mortgage in moutet's name belonged to a m giraud in whose house the young man had often played when a child he went at once to giraud's and paid a friendly call as though he had been strolling in the neighbourhood and wished merely to shake hands with his old friend it was about mid-september at the horizon the sea was slumbering heavy and motionless looking like an immense carpet of blue velvet the countryside extended yellow with sunshine hot and sweltering a gentle breeze rose at times from the shore and went lightly through the branches of the quivering pine trees when marius passed before the country house where his mother had nursed him a poignant emotion brought big tears to his eyes amidst the silence of this scorched and mournful desert he fancied he could hear the beloved voice of the saintly woman whose memory sustained him in his task of deliverance which was weighing him down giraud received him like the prodigal son one never sees you now he said come here sometimes and try and forget all your troubles you will find none but devoted friends here who will help you to pass a few more pleasant hours marius was touched at this reception he had often despaired of humanity since he had found himself face to face with the wickedness of life during an hour he quite forgot the reason of his visit it was giraud himself who gave an opening for the delicate inquiry the young man wished to institute you see said the master of the house we live happily here we're certainly not over rich but the few acres of land we possess suffice for our needs i thought you were in straitened circumstances replied marius the harvests have not been good giraud looked at the young man with surprise straight in circumstances he said not a bit of it why do you say that marius felt himself changing colour excuse me he stammered i don't wish to appear indiscreet i was told that after the last harvest you had been obliged to mortgage your property on hearing this giraud laughed aloud whoever told you that told you wrong he resumed thank heavens i've never mortgaged a single inch of land yet said marius further wishing to be quite sure i was told the notary's name it's m douglas who is stated to have taken the mortgage giraud continued laughing with his broad frank laugh m douglas is a worthy man he replied but whatever property he's got a mortgage on it's certainly not mine the day before marius had seen the document in which giraud's property was distinctly named and it moreover bore the owner's signature the notary had therefore committed a second forgery and this one could not be so easily explained as the first he had evidently kept the money which moutet had intended to be invested for himself marius withdrew desirous of thinking everything over before acting Outier did not exist and the property on which moutet was supposed to have a mortgage was also a fiction since giraud declared it was not his all this was a mystery which the young man dreaded to investigate on the monday morning after a feverish night he decided to call on the notary End of chapters five and six